World News Today, brought to you by Admiral Corporation in behalf of distributors and dealers all over America and in many foreign lands. By shortwave broadcast direct from important overseas stations and leading news centers of our own country, CBS reporters are waiting to bring you first-hand news from the world's political and battlefronts. Now here's Douglas Edwards. The Allies are giving the Germans a steady drubbing as the enemy retreats toward the Reich. General Patton's armored columns have made new advances between the Marne and Seine rivers. In southern France, Toulon is now completely ours, and the Allied bag of German prisoners has passed the 23,000 mark. Paris is swinging back to normalcy, despite some enemy sniping and a bombing attack by the Luftwaffe. General de Gaulle narrowly escaped death or injury yesterday when thousands of Parisians were thrown into panic by wild flurries of gunfire during a parade. On Europe's eastern front, Soviet troops are moving deeper into Romania. The Hungarian underground radio has called for revolt in Hungary. In Italy, the Germans are falling back toward the Gothic line, and Polish troops have driven a strong bridgehead across the Metaura River near the Adriatic. And in the Pacific, Allied naval air forces have carried out a heavy attack on Sumatra. Admiral Mountbatten's headquarters announces that Allied carrier-borne planes carried out a heavy attack on Jap installations on the western coast of Sumatra last Thursday. They hit a cement plant, Two vessels, wharves, warehouses, and a railway yard. The Japs didn't try to intercept the Allied surface units either during or after the attack. One plane was lost. The official German news agency, DNB, says the Japanese are evacuating Manila. A broadcast recorded in London by the Associated Press said the town of Manila is being evacuated and a number of restrictions on passenger traffic have been issued by President Jose Laurel head of the Japanese puppet government in the Philippines. And now, Admiral takes you direct to Paris. Allied troops continue to pour over the Seine above and below Paris. Only at scattered points are the Germans fighting rear guard actions to hold us up. The main movement of the German forces in France is northward and eastward toward Germany. West of Paris, we now have three bridgeheads across the Seine. There's the American one at mont which is being expanded in the face of not much more than sporadic artillery fire. There's the British one at Vernon, already three miles deep, and the Canadian bridgehead at Pont de Las, ten miles south of Rouen. These bridgeheads are the possible starting points for still another German pocket. At least Berlin seems to think that the Allies' next move is to drive to the sea and cut off everything north of Rouen and Le Havre. Even if this doesn't happen right away, the Germans fleeing over the Seine and out of that area will find we're running right alongside of them, nudging them with high explosives. Already, bombers and fighter bombers are ranging over the whole area by day, bombing columns and the fuel dumps they need to move. And fast mosquitoes are scourging them by night. Back on the left bank of the Seine, the Germans are still trying to fight their way across the river. They've only got a small pocket left, only a few square miles, completely surrounded by the Canadians who are hacking away at their rear guards. Most of the Germans are trying to get away up the narrow Seine loop to Rouen. Here, the river flowing around them makes them a perfect target. And in today's beautiful weather, our medium and fighter bombers have been sending their bombs down into closely packed German transport. The Germans are getting men back over the Seine, but they'll have to be completely reformed and re-equipped if they're to stand again and fight. There's no indication that they can do this much before the German border. On toward Paris, the left bank of the Seine is almost completely cleared of the enemy. And above the capital to the south, American troops are spilling over four more bridgeheads. Strong forces are pushing deep into the area between the Seine and the Marne. The ones shoving east from Melun have gone 23 miles to Tessy without meeting opposition. Farther east at Nogent, we're mopping up. And it's only where we've pushed on from Troyes that we're meeting considerable opposition now. It's there that we've come closest to Germany so far. The Saar is only 145 miles away. There's still plenty of excitement inside Paris. Yesterday afternoon, shots rang out in the Cathedral of Notre Dame as General de Gaulle attended a Thanksgiving Mass. And there continues to be sporadic shooting in various parts of the city. The Germans seem to have fairly strong groups of snipers in the northern and northeastern suburbs. Today, General Eisenhower arrived in Paris, and his first words were to praise the spirit of French resistance. 
Inside the city, the authorities are trying to hasten things back to normal. 3,000 tons of American food are promised daily for the next six weeks. Cans of meat, flour, fats, condensed milk, and chocolate will be coming in. But it's still only a fraction of the need. The meat ration is a half a pound a week. But normality isn't far off. Already, the first bicycle race has been arranged for the Vincent Velodrome tomorrow. While France is striving to return to normal, Germany is moving more rapidly toward crisis. Goebbels is trying to keep his people at work in the face of the catastrophic news coming in from all fronts. But this afternoon, the military catastrophe was brought much closer to home. For the first time, RAF heavy bombers have bombed Germany by daylight in strength. Between 250 and 500 Halifaxes went into the Ruhr this afternoon, into the happy valley that blossoms with flak to bomb another synthetic oil plant. The Luftwaffe couldn't keep them away. This combined bombing by day has been the prelude to great events ever since June 6th. It may well be that the RAF and the American Air Forces will now combine their tremendous strength to play the overture to Germany's last act. We return you now to Admiral in New York. That was Richard C. Hotlet in London. We had hoped to bring you a broadcast direct from Paris, and we regret that we were unable to do so. And now for a summary of the situation in Italy and southern France, Admiral takes you to CBS Rome, George Morad reporting. The battle for southern France, in a geographical sense, is almost over. In 12 zero wind days, French and Allied troops have seized to our front all the territory east of the Rhone flush to the Italian border. Inland, our troops are consistent for 100 miles deep, and probably a lot more if our communiques kept up with the army. The German 19th Army has been smashed and scattered. 23,000 of them are present. The main Allied elements are now pouring down the Rhone Valley. And the next big story to expect is the junction with Eisenhower's men. But it must be admitted that the Nazi rear guard accomplished their mission the smashing of two law on Marseille, keeping us out of their superb harbors when their whole southern front was in some precipitous flight. They've held these port areas for nearly a week now, fighting like cornered rats, and meanwhile blasting every facility which we so badly need. Today, the Nazis are about finished. In Toulon, a few are holding out on St. Mandrier, and in Marseille, several thousand are encircled on some high ground north of the canal. They're dying the hard way, but they did their job. The military achievement is plain. We've slammed home another broad segment in the steel circle that's storming and contracting around the right. But that contraction goes beyond the progress of armored columns. Chesilwing, fighting skillfully in northern Italy, is beginning to look over his shoulder. He ceases at Briançon, only 55 miles from Turin, and to his left he sees the escape routes into Austria closing. Possibly for this reason he's made a small but general retreat. Troops for the 8th Army have crossed the Mataro River, opening a bridgehead within nine miles of the Adriatic port of Pissarro. While the Allied victory has been dramatic enough, all this has really been overshadowed by the fierce spiritual resurgence of France. As village after village falls, and the Maquis spring out of every town and piece of forest, a wild thrill of hope must have raced across all Europe. Certainly it did in Italy. Italy, where four years ago people were chanting Corsica, Tunis, Djibouti. All that disappeared now in a grand burst of admiration for their Latin neighbor, for a France that is going back to the French. Winston Burdett says that with all the hatred and desire for revenge, the French are determined this won't ball up their plans for a strong and independent France. Along with the fighting Maki in each town, we invariably find the Vichyites are out and the local committee of liberation is ruling with a stern hand. General de Gaulle has evidently had delegates and organizers touring the country for many weeks, long before the invasion. There is no AMG, and they do accept our civil affairs officers in a purely advisory sense. But they say, we represent France until the French people go to the polls again. Unlike Italy, where indiscriminate settling of old scores brought such hardship on genuine patriots, the French are taking no chance on Allied interference. First, the Vichy local governments are automatically dissolved. Next, those guilty of espionage are handed over to the Allies. But the great bulk remaining 
collaborators and traitors are handed over to hard French justice. And for those Frenchmen who are lukewarm and timid when the heat was on, they'll be told now to moderate this last hour enthusiasm and not to interfere with the liberation government or foment criticism behind a mask of false patriotism. France apparently knows where she's going, and that's something new and very important on the deeply troubled European scene. This is George Moran in Rome. We're sending you now to Admiral Radio in New York. More news in just a moment, but first, here's Warren Sweeney with a message from Admiral Corporation. Do you like good music? Would you like to be able to enjoy a full symphony or concert without interruption? Then you'll want an Admiral Radio phonograph with an automatic record changer when the war is won. For by the Admiral Automatic Record Changer... You can load it with up to 12 records and sit back and enjoy your favorite music without bother. Admiral Corporation is the world's largest manufacturer of radio phonographs with automatic record changers, which is proof in itself of their excellence. And only Admiral has Slide Away. With Slide Away, there is no lid to lift. You simply open the cabinet doors, and out comes the complete phonograph turntable and automatic record changer, easy to reach, Convenient to load and unload. Slide Away, an exclusive Admiral feature, is one of the important reasons why Admiral has gained its leadership in this highly competitive field. So when victory has been won, plan to own an Admiral radio phonograph with Slide Away and the Admiral automatic record changer. Now here once again is Douglas Edwards. In Eastern Europe, the Russians are pushing deeper into Romania, and the Moscow radio reported a few hours ago that fighting is now going on at Foxani, just 77 miles northeast of Ploiesh. And now, to discuss with us the military significance of developments on the Russian Balkan front, here is Columbia's military analyst, Major George Fielding Elliott. A crushing disaster has overtaken yet another German army fighting on a distant front without adequate support and at the end of a long and precarious line of communication. This is becoming a tale whose weary repetition in Berlin does not yet seem to suggest to the military genius of Adolf Hitler that there is perhaps some fundamental error in the strategy of trying to hold about three times the territory which he has troops enough to defend. Stalingrad and Tunisia were warnings enough for ordinary common sense, but not for the Hitlerian intuition. The loss of the Fourth Army in White Russia the smashing of the 10th and 14th armies in Italy and their reduction to half their former strength, the cutting off of the 16th and 18th armies in the Baltic states, the destruction of the 7th army in Normandy, and the present precarious condition of the 19th army in southern France and of the 15th army on the pas de calais coast have followed in grim succession. Now the 6th and 8th armies have been broken in Romania. Hitler is still trying to hold distant positions, which he is no longer strong enough to defend. Apparently, the 6th and 8th Armies in Romania, forming an army group under the command of Colonel General Scharner, originally had a strength of 34 divisions of all types, that is, German divisions. Of these, 12 divisions have been shifted north into Poland under the, under the necessities of the moment. That leaves 22 German divisions in Romania, of which two are armored divisions. Most of these troops were holding a line from Bender on the Dniester River across the Prut Valley through Kishinev and Yasi to the Siret River and the Carpathian Mountains. This line has now been broken through by a Russian drive southward between the Prut and the Siret, and it has also been outflanked by a Russian thrust over, over the Dniester below Bender. The result is that the German troops on the left wing have been driven back to the Foxani Galat Gap between the mountains and the delta of the Danube, while those on the right wing some 12 out of the 22 German divisions have been cut off and surrounded. The extent of the German disaster is pointed up by the fact that in just one day yesterday, the Russians report the capture of 31,000 German prisoners. The Romanians were so impressed by the Russian blows that they have changed sides and appear to be joining the Russians against the Germans. Bucharest is said to be cleared of German forces, which means that the rail communications of the German troops holding the Foxani Galat Gap are virtually severed and Russian troops are reported fighting inside Foxani itself. Now here again is Douglas Edwards. The French report that all organized German resistance has ended in southwestern France. And now for a report from Spain, Admiral takes you to San Sebastian, Glenn Stadler reporting. The French 
Spanish frontier is now clear of German troops. French officials here in San Sebastian received the news which was a dramatic climax to the two-year occupation of the rugged Pyrenees border. The scene of this final disengaging movement was about 80 miles east of here and 30 miles south of the famous Shrine of Lourdes. Three companies of Wehrmacht officers and soldiers commandeered automobiles and at the point of Tommy guns forced French chauffeurs to drive them over the frontier where they surrendered the Spanish authorities and were interned. The 400 newly arrived deserters brought the estimated total of imprisoned German soldiers in this area to 1,500. Most of them are being held at Mirando del Ebro, 90 miles southwest of San Sebastian. This concentration camp, which is a capacity of 4,000, now is reserved entirely for Germans. In the past four years, tens of thousands of refugees fleeing from the Nazis have passed through Miranda. The last French internees were removed from the camp three days ago to make room for Germans. Eighty Frenchmen were leaving just as the first groups of Germans arrived. It was a red-letter day for the French, even though they still had days of internment yet before their release could be arranged. Eighty voices raised the stirring pitch and the Marseillaise burst forth over the encampment. It drowned out the noise of weary German soldiers dragging their equipment toward the bunkhouses. This afternoon, reports from across the frontier say that all is calm. Yesterday at the International Bridge, however, a Vichyite was treated by a Spanish doctor for a bullet wound in the leg. He had tried to escape. In the areas around Andai, Saint-Jean-de-Luce and Biarritz, food is plentiful. The liberated French are dining on food abandoned by the disengaged Germans. Thousands of tins had been piling up in Andai warehouses for weeks. They were destined for Nazi consumption, but it seems that trains just wouldn't run. French crews always had found something wrong. Broken axles, missing nuts and bolts. And anyway, if they did manage that strong Nazi insistence to get a locomotive stoked up, the tracks were impassable because of Mackey sabotage. German authorities became more and more exasperated. But the French just shrugged their shoulders and laughed up their sleeves. Then, the day after the German withdrawal, broken axles seemed to mend themselves. Lost nuts and bolts were easily found, and railroad tracks miraculously became serviceable again, just as if tucked into place by some great unseen giant. In reality, of course, that giant was the French underground, now working in the free open air after four bitter, repressive years of Nazi occupation. Now, here's a nice report from the International Bridge. The American ambassador, Mr. Hayes, crossed into France this afternoon to pay his respects to the FFI commander in Andai. He then returned to San Sebastian. And this is Glenn Sadler in San Sebastian, returning you to Admiral in New York. For news on the home front and an interview with the officer commanding the training of our assault landing troops, Admiral takes you to CBS Washington, Joe McCaffrey reporting. I would like you to meet an army officer who took a page out of the training books of the Nazis, then tossed in a generous share of American organizing genius and fired it back at the Germans themselves. This is Colonel Paul W. Thompson of the Corps of Engineers who has been brought back to the States in accordance with the policy of having officers with combat experience on duty in the Chief of Staff's Operations Division. Colonel Thompson was commanding officer of the U.S. Assault Training Center in England where the assault forces which took part in the Normandy landings on D-Day were trained. Colonel, suppose you tell us where you picked up some of your best background on assault work. I served in Germany with our military attaché during the time the Nazis were building up their army. There I observed the German methods of assault against permanent land fortifications. Later, our own engineers at Fort Belvoir took these German methods, improved on them, and adapted them to American equipment and armament. In England, we took the final step by adapting our assault technique to the spatial problems of an amphibious assault against the coastal fortifications of western France. Tell us something about the training of our assault forces in England, Colonel. Well, the initial step was to establish the U.S. Assault Training Center. That was in February of 1943, 16 months before D-Day. The assault training center was located on the western coast of England, where the beaches and tides are very similar to those of Normandy. Establishing the center was quite a job because we had to reproduce the fortifications and obstacles which we knew existed or would exist across the channel. 
Then we took standard American combat teams, infantry, artillery, engineers, and all, and we trained them in the details of the landing assault action ahead. For example, we had to alter the normal infantry platoon formation because the standard naval assault landing craft, the LCVP, holds only 30 soldiers. The basis of our training was this 30-man assault section. How long did it take to train, say, a regiment, Colonel? About three weeks. I should add that the units which came to us already had been through either actual combat or the amphibious training centers in this country. The units were good when we got them. Were the units completely trained and ready for D-Day when they left your assault training center? No. After leaving us, the units went into further months of intensive training, including large-scale rehearsals under their own tactical commanders. At the assault training center, we showed them how, and then they went ahead and practiced. What would you say were the reasons for the success of the Normandy landings, Colonel? I think it was a combination of sound technique, fine weapons and equipment, and superlative soldiers. Everything depends on the soldier. On the soldier and his immediate leaders, the non-coms and the junior officers. That is true in every military action, and it's especially true in landing assaults against heavily fortified coasts. Colonel, I understand that you took part in the landing as commander of an engineering brigade. I know that your brigade landed at a spot where the going was toughest and that you were wounded while leading your troops against enemy fortification. We are glad to see you are fully recovered and now wear the Distinguished Service Cross as well as the Purple Heart. I return you to Admiral in New York. Big Marianas-based 7th Air Force Liberators hit Iwo Jima in the Volcano Islands for the second time in less than 24 hours toward the weekend, while other Army and Navy warplanes pounded Yap, Nauru, and other Japanese positions in the Carolines and the Marshalls. The B-24s dropped 47 tons of bombs on Iwo Jima in a daylight bombing, following a night attack. While the night raid was made without interception and against meager anti-aircraft fire, the daylight raid stirred up moderate to intense flak and approximately ten interceptors. Three Jap fighters were destroyed, one was damaged. Two liberators were hit. Army and Navy planes gave Nauru a good working over in their third and fourth attacks in three days, and Admiral Nimitz says Ventura search planes returned to the phosphate island for the second time on Wednesday, and on Thursday, Ventura's and 7th Air Force Mitchell's Again, heavily bombed runways, gun positions, and the town. And now, once again, here is Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral. Probably no feature of the Admiral two-temperature refrigerator is more important to your family's health than Sterilamp. Just a minute, Mr. Sweeney. I've heard you mention Sterilamp on this program several times. Just exactly what is Sterilamp? Sterilamp is an amazing scientific protection for foods that gives off a special kind of ultraviolet rays. These rays are harmless to food... But as they are reflected throughout the regular storage compartment of the Admiral refrigerator, they actually kill bacteria and mold on exposed food surfaces. As you can readily see, Sterilamp reduces food waste. But in addition to guarding your food and the health of your family, Sterilamp eliminates icebox odors. Thank you. Now I know about Sterilamp. Are these other features as interesting as Sterilamp? Well, lady... You never have to defrost the regular storage compartment, and there's more food storage room because the space-stealing coils are gone. You never have to use covered dishes to prevent food from drying out. And the built-in home freezer holds two bushels of frozen foods. In short, there will be just as many advantages in the Admiral refrigerator as there have been in Admiral Radio, which have made it America's smart set. Your money invested in war bonds now helps to ensure a healthy, prosperous America the kind we all want for our families. Money invested today in war bonds and kept there helps safeguard your own post-war financial security. So invest in the safest thing in the world. Buy more war bonds than before. World News Today is brought to you each Sunday at this hour by Admiral Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set, and post-war makers of Admiral Refrigerators, Admiral Home Freezers, Admiral Electric Ranges. Be sure to listen again next Sunday when Admiral brings you World News Today by shortwave, direct from leading news centers of the world. And here's a thought for everyone. Six million Americans are fighting overseas. Here at home, let's all remember that until final victory everywhere, winning the war still comes first with every last one of us. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. WBBM Chicago for the...